you have your Bibles tonight, we want to invite your attention to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and in just a few moments we'll be looking at verses 4 through 9 as we begin our examination of God's Word. I do want to mention how thankful I am for Paul leading our singing today and also for Jake leading us in a word of prayer tonight to our Heavenly Father. I was asked just a few moments ago if I was going to follow in the footsteps of Wade tonight and uh, cutting the lesson down just a little bit. Uh, we'll have to see about that. We'll have to see about how the lesson goes tonight, the progress that we make, and uh, and how quick we do it. But we are thankful that you're here with us, especially those who may be visiting. We definitely hope that you will come back and be with us at any opportunity that you have. I do want to mention just uh, one quick announcement. Uh, next Sunday will be Promotion Sunday for our cradle roll through the 12th grade. And so parents, uh, please keep that in mind. The next Sunday they'll go to their, their next class, the, the uh, next class in line, if uh, they are subject to that. So please remember that. Also in regards to our teachers, uh, those that weren't able to be in the education meeting, uh, we do want to, to really encourage you to try to be here at least 10 minutes before class starts. Uh, that makes an impact on the young people as they're coming into class. For those who are regulars and even those who are visitors, and it's always uh, good to, to be able to see a teacher in there than to have children wandering around and wondering where their teacher is uh, when they don't come rolling in until 930. And so please uh, remember that. Mine, I did mention, if you need to use the resource room, please come 30 minutes early. And so if you get here between 10 and 30 minutes early, uh, you'll definitely be prepared for class, hopefully, and uh, be ready to receive uh, the young people as they come in. Speaking of our education for just a moment, our 10th through 12th graders in college class on Sunday mornings this summer quarter had an opportunity to study a book written by Brother Ken Butterworth where he talked about things that he learned in the first grade. And the basic thesis of, of the book was he mentions that everything that he learned about how to live, who to be, and also what to do, he learned it by the time he was in the first grade. Someone once said that wisdom is not learned on the graduate level, but it's learned in the sandbox. And when you think about things that children are learning at a young age before they ever get into the first grade, that many of them have learned what it means to play fair that they've learned not to take things from others, that they've learned how to, to clean up their messes, that they learn how to apologize when they hurt someone else's feelings, that they learn the basics of the golden rule, treating others the way that they want to be treated. Well, how do they learn these things? Is it just simply instinct that they learn it? Are they pre-programmed in their DNA to have godly standards just automatically? Are they reading and studying? And we're talking about a five and six year old here. Most of the things that our young people that are five and six year old, when, when they learn things, that they learn it from seeing it and also hearing it over and over and over again by someone they look up to. That's where they're learning these things. And it could perhaps be that they've learned some of those from a kindergarten teacher. It could be that they've learned some of them from a Bible class teacher. But you know where the primary responsibility of these basic learning principles, who has that? Mom and dad have those. And mom and dad are the ones that have the primary responsibility of laying the foundation so that they can have a proper relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now as we think about those principles for just a moment as we lay the foundation for our study, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4-9, through 9, Moses is going to give the children of Israel some basic principles that every family needs to know. And I think those basic principles, you and I will be able to apply them in our lives today in the 21st century as well. Tonight we want to notice three basic things from this message that Moses had for the children of Israel. Number one, he told them what they were to believe. Number two, he reminded them of who they were supposed to love. And then number three, he talks about how and when you go about teaching them. 
Let's begin with that first point tonight from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. The first thing that he's going to mention to them is what they were to believe. Let's pick up there. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. This was one of the first things that every Israelite child was taught. It was called the Shema. And the reason why it was called the Shema was because of the first word. It's our English word here. But the Hebrew word for here was Shema. And so there you have it. That's the reason why they called uh, this particular idea, this particular uh, passages uh, of Scripture that they were going to be studying and learning about, this was the name for it. Now let me ask you this question for just a moment. Why teach them such a basic, fundamental message? Surely if any people in the world at this time knew what Moses said, surely it was the children of Israel. That's not the case. This particular generation of Israelites at this particular time, they are far removed from that generation that was a part of the exodus out of Egypt. This was a new generation that was about to enter, it was on the horizon, if you will, about to enter into the promised land. And so there were some things that they needed to be reminded about. There were some things that they needed to be taught about in case they didn't know them. And the very first thing he tells them to believe is that here, O Israel, there is one Lord. The Lord thy God, He is one. As we think about that for just a moment, what was the basic message that he was trying to get across? Well, let's break down the passage just a little bit. When he says the Lord, that's the Hebrew word for Yahweh. And Yahweh was a description of the eternal nature of God. The second thing that he mentions here, he says the Lord our God. This was from the Hebrew word Elohim. And so we've got Yahweh, we've got Elohim, and this particular word is a description of His power and His might. The third idea that He's going to push across here is that the Lord our God is one Lord. You see, they were living during a particular time period where there was a lot of polytheism that was taking place. The groups that were around them were serving a number of little g-gods. Many of them were serving a number of Baals. And so the message that he's putting across is that we are to be a monotheistic group of people. And the God that we serve, there is none other like Him. His eternal nature and power, none of these other gods can compare to Him. Now let's think about some other references for just a moment. This wouldn't be the first time that they would hear a message quite like this. When you drop back to Deuteronomy chapter 4 for a moment, you look at verse 35, uh, Moses says, The Lord, He is God, there is none else beside Him. And he reiterates it down in verse 39, it says, There is none else. There's nobody else like the God that we serve. In Zechariah 14 and verse 9, one of the minor prophets uh, talked about him as being one Lord. You may recall back in Exodus 20 and verse 3, one of the Ten Commandments laying the foundation for the rest of them, there shall have no other gods before me. God wanted to be number one. And He still wants to be number one in our lives today. Now what relevance does this have for our lives today in the 21st century? What relevance does this that we read about in the Old Testament have in my life today? Well, you'll recall Romans 15 and verse 4 and 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11 that those things that were written aforetime, those examples, they were written for our learning, they were written for our benefit. And when you tie in... Uh, John chapter 20 and verse 31, Jesus says these things were written so that you might do what? That you might believe. 
And so the relevance for my life, the relevance for your life today, is so that we might believe the things that we read about in the Word of God. Now let's, let's take this idea just a little bit further. You know how we mentioned just a moment ago that surely these individuals, if there was any group of individuals that should have known that there was one God, the children of Israel should have been it. Some people may have the, have the idea today, even in the 21st century, well, all young people know about the God of heaven. That's not so. We're living in a day and age where atheism is the fastest growing religion in the entire world. And we're having this doctrine shoved down our throats that there is no God. And a secondary thought that goes along with this is that we live in a society today that teaches that everything is relative. That there is nothing that is absolute. And Moses, he's pushing this across and he said, you better believe that there's one thing that we can know for sure. That the Lord thy God, that He is one Lord. We'll go over to the New Testament for a moment. If you look at Mark 12 and verse 29, Jesus is going to quote Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. If you go over to 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, he said, there is one God. Do you know that the same God that Paul and Jesus spoke about is the same God that Moses talked about. No difference at all. It was the same exact one. And it's the same God then, the same God now that's able to provide salvation for us. It's the same God then as it is now that we are supposed to worship. It was the same God then, the same God now, that's able to, to provide salvation as, as far as the context in forgiving our sins. And so we're following the same one, we're obeying the same one. And so as we think about the message that Moses is getting across, he says, this is who you're supposed to believe. And it would never change throughout all of the Scriptures. It would be the same God over and over and over that every person needs to believe. But let's move on and let's look at a second point. Second point in verse 5, He tells them who they're supposed to love. So we know that there's one God. Now watch who He says they're supposed to love. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Do you know that if you turn over into the New Testament, that Jesus, He will make the same quotations from this passage as well, at least three different times. We read about it in Matthew 22, Mark chapter 12, and also Luke chapter 10. And when Jesus is quoting these, there are four groups of individuals that are challenging Him at this time. There are four groups of individuals that are trying to trip Him up in His teachings. You've got the Pharisees who are considered to be the ultra-conservatives of the day, the ultra-conservative Jews. You've got the Sadducees, who's another sect of the Jews that were considered to be the liberals of the day. You've got the Herodians, and then also the scribes, and these scribes were members of the Sanhedrin Council. And every single one of them is trying to come at him at a different angle in order to challenge him. And you notice the first thing that he mentions here when he talks about loving God? He says you need to love Him with all of your heart. Now when he talks about loving God with all of their hearts, if you look at Mark chapter 12 and verse 29, the first thing that Jesus says is the first thing that Moses says back there in verse 4. He says, hear. Listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth is basically what he's saying. You need to know what the Word of God has to say, and quit focusing so much on the traditions of men. You need to quit focusing so much on how you're going to be seen in the light of men and start focusing on where your heart is. Now let's ask this question. 
when he made reference to the heart, was he talking about the organ that's beating inside of our body? That's pumping the blood all over from our brains down to our toes? I think there's probably a connection with it, but let's look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 4. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? And so when He talks about their thoughts, and He talks about their hearts, He's talking about the intellectual and emotional seats. He's talking about the inner nature of man. I want your inside, because what's on the inside is going to proceed forth on the outside. At least nine different times. In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about loving God with our hearts and with our soul. When Jesus talked about it, when Moses talked about it, He was making reference to loving Him with every ounce of our being. Now let's take it over to the 21st century for just a moment. Take it over to the year 2011. How does this apply to us today? What areas of my life, what areas of your life is it going to affect? Well, when we truly love God, it's going to affect every aspect of our life. It's going to affect my attendance to Bible class. It's going to affect my attendance to worship. You know, sometimes there are individuals that willfully forsake the assembling of themselves with others in order to worship God. Hebrews 10 and verse 25. That there are those that, that, um, uh, that won't come just simply because they don't want to. We're not talking about individuals that, that are sick. We're not talking about individuals that something has happened where it's out of their hands that they can't make it to worship service. We're talking about those that willfully don't come. When somebody willfully doesn't come, I think we're dealing with a heart problem there. Does God have your heart? If He has my heart, I'm going to be interested in coming to Bible class on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. If He has my heart, I'm going to be interested in coming and worshiping Him on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. It's going to affect our prayer lives. When you truly love someone, you're going to communicate with them, aren't you? And God wants us to communicate with Him. You know, it's, it's going to affect our Bible study. It's going to affect how often we consult His Word. How often we read it. How often we study it. For so many, Sunday morning and Wednesday night is the only time that they open up the Word of God during the week. You know, the story is told about a woman who was at a bookstore one day. And there was a particular book that she was looking at, and she decided, well, I'm going to buy this book. She went home. She tried to read it that night. Couldn't even get through the first chapter. She thought, this is the worst book that I have ever read in my life. Guess what she does? She tosses it aside, puts it on the end of the bookshelf, has no plans to go back and read it ever again. Years later, she got set up on a date with a gentleman. She goes out and she eats with this man. They're getting to know one another. It was a blind date, and so they're getting to know one another. And in the midst of the conversation, she asks, so what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a writer. Well, what books have you written? And he told her about the book that he had written. Guess what she did that night? She went home. She picked it up off the bookshelf. She started reading it. She couldn't put it down. She was interested in this man. She was starting to develop feelings for him, wanted to know more about him. And before you know it, they fell in love together. What's your feelings like for God? Are you in love with the Heavenly Father? Do you love Him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength? Or are you just simply visiting with Him twice a week? I hope that you'll take the time to read about Him, study about Him. Find out what He wants you to do with your life and what He'll have you to become. He 
wants us to love Him with every ounce of our being. When it comes to the effects that it will have on our life, we'll be interested in teaching others because we'll realize that they're lost and that if somebody doesn't teach them, hell is going to be awaiting for them. It will affect our giving. We won't give out of necessity. We'll give willingly. But it's going to affect our daily lives as well. It's going to affect how we act tomorrow. It's going to affect what we do on Tuesday. It's going to affect the people that we associate ourselves with on Thursdays and Fridays. Why? Because of who it is that we love. Let's move to the third point. We've noticed what it is that we're to believe. Number two, we've noticed who it is that we're supposed to love. But then number three, how and when do we go about teaching our family members about who it is that we're supposed to love? How do we go about teaching the one and only God? Let's pick up there at verse 6, and he's going to tell us how. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently. This is the how. What better way to describe how a child is supposed to be taught than in a diligent way? The idea of diligence is to, to restate, to reiterate, to do something over and over and over again. One of the word pictures that I found in study of this particular word, diligent, carries with it the idea of something that, that's, that has uh, basically a grinding or friction over and over and over again. And the first thing that came to my mind was basically a blade that needs sharpening. Many of you guys, and perhaps even ladies before, have had to have your lawnmower blades sharpened. And if you've ever sharpened these blades or watched somebody else sharpen the blades, do they just stick it on there for a second and, okay, it's finished, it's sharpened? What do you have to do? You have to put it on that grinder for, for a little bit of time, and you've got to go back and forth, back and forth, and that friction is going over and over and over, sharpening. That's the idea behind this. It's going over and over and over again. But when you have to go over something again and again and again, what's that going to require? It's going to require some patience, isn't it? I'm sure that most of you know that have children and grandchildren, and perhaps even great-grandchildren. Those of you that are teachers in school, it requires patience with our young people, doesn't it? Aylan is going through what you might call those terrible twos right now. And there are times that we have to go over things several times with her. But the purpose for it is for her own good. But we have to be patient with her and understand that, that she is trying to understand, that she is trying to develop in the process. Not only does it take patience, it's going to take, it's going to take a purpose. It's going to take a sense of devotion, some practicality, and some judgment that's going to go along with it as well. And so when Moses talks about teaching them, he says, do it in a diligent way. Don't just teach them one day and then forget about it. It's got to be something that's done over and over and over again. Number two, and thou shalt talk of them when? When thou sittest in the house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. If you want to sum those four things up that he talks about there, use every opportunity that you have. Use every opportunity throughout the day, throughout the week that you have in order to teach them. That's where that diligence comes in. Verse 8, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Now here we see some more of the literal teachings that are coming out with that of the Old Covenant. And when he talks about the frontlets that, that they would have and a sign upon their hands, the, the closest thing that we have to it in the New Testament, most commentators believe, is found in Matthew 23 and verse 5, where Jesus talks about phylacteries. And here he's condemning the Pharisees because of the phylacteries that they are wearing. Well, what is a phylactrophy? What is that frontlet that he's talking about there? Well, a phylactery was basically a square-shaped or a cube-shaped piece of leather. And it would have some straps on it in order to strap it somewhere on the body. Most individuals 
there, there were at least two places that they would put them, two customary places that they would put them. And one of the places would be on the inner side of the left forearm. And they would strap it. It would strap over the back side of the forearm. And then they would have a string. This is the sign upon the hand. They would string it to one of the fingers. And you know, whenever they would eat or they would have to go into battle and raise their sword, the design of this left part of the inner forearm, guess where it's going over? It's going over the heart. The design was to make an impression on the heart. The second place that they would have them would be on their foreheads, those frontlets between the eyes. Well, as time has passed, You get over here to the New Testament and Jesus is condemning them. Why does He do that? Because they're only doing it to be seen of men. All you're doing it is for show. Your heart's not in it anymore. The design of these phylacteries was to be a reminder to them. You go to verse 9 and He's going to give something else that's going to be a reminder. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Some have even mentioned that they would be on the bedchamber as well. So if you put these passages of Scripture on the bedchamber, you put it on the doorpost of the house, and then you put it on on the gatepost, you're going to be reminded of the Word of God coming and going. You're going to be taught these things in every aspect of your life. You're going to be constantly reminded of them on a daily basis. Now let's start bringing this into the 21st century for just a moment and and make some applications for us today. You know, when we think about our our young people, they do a lot of observing. They observe the things that older individuals do, people that they look up to. And a lot of times they try to imitate, they try to mimic the things that they've been taught. And when you look over at Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, Peter and John are giving a reply, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I've heard this particular question asked several times, and it seems to be getting asked more and more frequently. And there's been a number of answers that I've heard, but there seems to be a common thread, a common denominator of an answer that's there. The question is, why are we losing our young people? And one of the common answers that I continually hear is because they don't have the knowledge that they need. They don't have the Bible knowledge that they need. Whose responsibility is it to teach them those things? It goes back to mom and dad. It goes back to the parents. Sure, the Bible class teacher can take part in this. And we even have some teachers in the secular field that try to do their part and be shining lights here at South Haven when they go back to school on Mondays through Fridays that try to instill these principles. But their primary responsibility goes back to the family. It was that way then with Moses, and it's the same way with our families today. Tonight we've talked about basic principles that every family needs to know. I want to close by asking you a question. Why do you teach your children? Why do you place boundaries around them and instruct them on things that they can do and things that they can't do? Now if I were to ask these young people over here, they might say, well, it's because mom and dad are trying to cramp my lifestyle. It's because mom and dad don't love me. It's because mom and dad don't want me to have any fun whatsoever. But it's for their good. Why did God give these principles to His children? If you look at Deuteronomy 6 and verse 24, Moses says it's for their good. That's how he concludes this thought of Scripture. For their good. Someone once described the Bible in an acrostic, and they described it as basic instructions before leaving earth. We have a responsibility of giving our children those basic instructions before leaving earth. Perhaps you may be here tonight, 
and you've never been obedient to the gospel of Christ. We want to give you those instructions this evening before you leave, and hopefully you'll make the right choice. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 3.16, and are willing to repent of your sins, Acts 17.30 and 31, and willing to make the great confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8 and verse 37, and then be immersed into Christ for the remission of your sins, the washing away of those sins, Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16, you can leave here today as a child of God. Perhaps you're here tonight and And as you're examining your life and you're thinking about these basic instructions, perhaps at one time you were following the basic instructions that we read about in the Word of God in order to keep you faithful to God. But as you examine yourself right now, you realize, you know, I've really strayed away. And perhaps it is, maybe you've neglected some of your responsibilities. The idea of this sermon tonight is not to shame anyone. The idea of it is to encourage us so that we'll set that goal to give our children the basic instructions before leaving earth and making sure that they're trained by godly standards in godly ways. If you're subject to heaven's invitation tonight, whether it's in obedience to the gospel or coming back to the fold through repentance and prayer, won't you come as together we stand and as we sing?